Well, hello, everybody, and welcome. You have tuned in to episode number 415 of the most terrific amateur radio podcast on the Internet. This is Linux in the Ham Shack, and this is our deep dive episode. Today, we're going to go back and revisit the Open Research Institute, which is something that I barely remember anything about because it was episode 238 when we talked to the folks over there last um, and they're already trying to jump in over my intro, but that's okay. We'll, we'll, we'll march on and, uh, let's <laughs> just go ahead and do our basic intro first. I'm Russ K5TUX. I'm Cheryl W5MOO. And I'm Bill NE4RD. All right. So let, let's not waste any more time. We have with us Michelle Thompson, W5NYV of the Open Research Institute, CEO and co-founder I have here in my notes. So, uh, VIP of the ORI, and as <laughs> anybody knows, we are uh, really into our acronyms and uh, <laughs> initialisms here. So, uh, welcome, Michelle, or welcome back, I should say, and thanks for being here. Oh, thank you so much. This is such a wonderful show and a, a great opportunity. You all are, are fantastic. Well, thank you for saying so. Um, Many would disagree, but that's okay. We can keep our opinions to ourselves. Um, but that's all right. We, we've continued to plug on. We've done 415 of these things. There must be something to it. Who knows? Um, I will say that uh, Bill put in our little notes here that I should go check out the ORI's YouTube channel, which I did. And there was some interesting stuff over there. The only thing that was a little weird was you were doing some stuff with, um, like, sending video signals using uh, SDR. And um, there wasn't any, like, preamble for any of that stuff, so I was, like, kind of confused. But maybe we can talk about that later. Before we get to that, let's just have you go ahead and introduce yourself. Tell us a little bit about yourself, because we've all probably forgotten everything you told us uh, umpteen episodes ago. And then uh, after you've done that, filled us in, you can tell us what is the ORI. Sure. Thank you so much. Well, I'm an engineer. Uh, I have some some book learning. Uh, I got a master's degree in information theory, uh, which is a specialty that deals with uh, error correction and compression. Uh, it's uh, packed full of uh, really icky math. Uh, so the formal side, that's, uh, that's my background. I have uh, five years of experience in cellular telephony, um, design and test for space and terrestrial systems. That was at Qualcomm Incorporated. And since then, I've been doing a variety of embedded hardware and software design. The uh, IEEE has gotten a lot of my time. I started a chapter for information theory, so other people that do icky math for uh, digital communications can gather together and commiserate, uh, mainly over the math. Uh, and I've done a little bit of traveling to speak about uh, open source satellite work, um, which is what ORI is about, and also about uh, algorithmic music composition, which is a, another thing uh, that I've been involved with over the past 10 years or so. I like to do 3D printing of uh, different types of antenna designs. So I've done 10 gigahertz, 122 gigahertz. I've done um, some transitions for microwave and some six port structures, uh, all sorts of different things with uh, 3D printed uh, antennas. Now you might be asking, how do you turn plastic into metal? And and there's a really cool trick for that. So you can get a paint, a metallized paint. This is what you might have seen uh, for RFI, to suppress RFI and like guitars and things like that. And as long as you get some, some very high conductivity paint, then the microwave horn or antenna that you paint 3D printed acts just like metal. So that's another uh, area that I try to help out with. So that's that's me and sort of the sort of professional training and engineering. Um, a couple of years ago, 2018, um, uh, Bruce Perrins and I co-founded uh, Open Research Institute. And we did this in order to give ourselves a formal structure for the work that was going on in open source satellite and open source amateur radio terrestrial. So amateur satellite and terrestrial stuff that, that sort of needed a home. Uh, we applied for and got a 501c3 designation in the, in the United States. And ever since then, we've just been trying to collect up projects uh, that need a home and that are helping advance the state of the art in amateur satellite and terrestrial uh, amateur radio. So it, we're a nonprofit R&D organization. So we do research and development and all of the work is given away. It's all open source and it's also open access and open process. 
So instead of just publishing the end product, what we try very hard to do whenever we possibly can is to show the process of making something, including all the mistakes and, you know, all of the oopsie doos and cul-de-sacs and things like that. And the reason that we do this is to try to show that this work is accessible uh, to not just experts, um, that there, there, are, there is a lot of work and, and a lot of bugs along the way. Uh, and we, we want to make it to where it's, uh, it's something that people can, can feel like they can volunteer for, uh, to pitch in where, wherever they're, they're kind of, whatever, at whatever level they're at. Our board of directors is, there's five of us that are on the ORI board. Keith Wheeler, Steve Conklin, uh, who I believe you know, uh, Karen Ruger, uh, Ben Hilburn, uh, those names might also be familiar, the act, both active and open source and RF and SDR and me. And then Bruce Perrins is now our president emeritus. He's not currently on the board, but continues to advise us. So that's who we who we are. We're affiliated with the Open Source Initiative. Uh, we're an affiliate member. We're a member society of, of AMSAT North America. And we're a community mem member of, of, of the RISC International. So that's the things that we're officially part of. Um, we've agreed and support the Open Space Manifesto from Liba Space Foundation. And we're active with a bunch of other organizations, including IEEE and NASA uh, universities. And we're uh, setting up frameworks to work with for-profit companies in space that are also committed to open source. Uh, so that's been a quite the adventure there. We have people that are um, all over the world. We have uh, participants that are from all over the United States, Canada, Spain, uh, Germany, Poland, the Netherlands, uh, the UK, uh, several in India, Japan, and Indonesia, and Australia. And we do have uh, participants and some, some, some activity going on in uh, South America. And as of yet, we don't have any active participants from Africa, but we're working with uh, organizations like like YASMI and keeping in touch with uh, efforts to to increase amateur radio uh, volunteerism and activity in Africa as well. We have lots of projects. We have the the main transponder project, uh, so it's a, a broadband microwave transponder for space, all digital, uh, and that's called. Uh, P4DX, that's one of the names of it, or Phase 4. Uh, and then we are the fiscal sponsors for M17 Project. We are working on reviving a, uh, a large dish at the Space Center in Huntsville. That's that's something we've started to, to work on, and we hope that it will be used uh, in, for citizen science and amateur radio uh, it, within a few years. We have done a lot of regulatory work for ITAR and EAR and debris mitigation. Uh, we're doing a battery matching process. So you take cells, raw cells, and build up batteries that are very well matched and, and good for space. We're working uh, with Ambisat to try to respin the board so it's easier to get uh, FCC approval for that particular open source satellite project. And we also do a little bit of 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 biology. So we, we are, uh, we do have a project that works with bacteriophage research. This is an area where open source uh, medical research is, uh, is possible. And so that's the type of work that we do. It is fascinating, actually, but I was wondering who's breathing. Is that you, Bill? Uh, no, that's not me. <laughs> oh, interesting. I don't think it was me. <laughs> it wasn't that exciting. Um, <laughs> I'll have to work harder. <laughs> uh, but terrible. you you do have your hands in a lot of projects, obviously, as we've just learned. But can you maybe like whittle down what you what the ORI's role in these projects is, or is it too varied to sort of encapsulate? Oh sure, no. Open Research Institute is a so we we are set up as a research institute. Um, not a membership society, not a club or anything like that. So it's you can you can look at it as if it's an umbrella for projects. So ORI is extremely lightweight and has a very small footprint by itself. And its job is to provide logistics funding and expert advice uh, for for projects. So a project is either grown up out of things that we want to see happen, like for the phase four ground and space effort, the transponder work. That's really the only one that is 
anywhere close to being an internal project. The rest of them are projects that we uh, help. So we we say you can you can use us as your 501c3. You are a project underneath uh, ORI, and and then as much or as little help is needed is given. So if they need lots of logistic support, lots of uh, financial help, uh, lots of administrative help, then we'll do the best that we can. And if they're they're good, or if that project is is pretty lightweight and it doesn't need a lot of that sort of thing, then the volunteers just work and things things progress. So it's a research institute. It's a it's a place for projects to come and get some help or have get a home. So how do the projects find you or how do you find the projects? Well, that's a really good question. It's it's a, a wide variety of ways. Usually it's because um, as a raging extrovert, I talk to all sorts of people. So you never know who you're going to run into at the grocery store or uh, at a conference, um, you know, or on a Zoom call or on the Internet, um, you know, and it's heavily word of mouth and also just just having a, a good uh, decent presence on the on the web so putting all of our work out there and publishing it doing presentations uh, anywhere that will have us uh, presenting the work showing uh, the accessibility of it uh, promoting open source and open access and open open process and over time you will, but, you know, people will will, find, will be able to find you. Projects that we talk to um, or other organizations that we have alliances with and memberships in, those are have been great in identifying potential projects that may need our particular help. Since we're we're focused mainly on on open source amateur radio digital communications for space and terrestrial, that's mainly what we do. And those communities are all, um, it's, it is a far flung and there are a lot of them, but you know, with, with some good word of mouth and some effort, you can get the word out to, to explain that you're here to help. All right. Very good. Um, <clears throat> let's see, this is probably a question for later. So before, before I get into some of the things, what it'll probably come up in the just general discussion, but, um, Bill has put in some notes in here, so I'm going to try and go with those. And uh, he picked a couple of the projects that you're working with. Um, and the first one you mentioned was sort of your, I don't know if you want to call it your core project, but um, the Phase 4 ground station project. I know we talked about that the first time we talked with you, but um, surely there's been a great deal of advancement and, um, you know, progress with that project since the last time we talked to you about it. So. Uh, maybe you can outline the project and like, I, how how long ago was two thirty eight? Like three years ago, four years ago? <laughs> so, yeah, it was in twenty eighteen. So it was just after the ORI was founded. So yeah, yeah, yeah. so really early on. So maybe a lot uh, has changed. Yeah, yeah it, no, it, it really it <laughs> plus really, funding, right? You have a lot yes. of funding that has come into that project. Yes, yeah, I was going to ask about that because I'm, I'm I was kind of interested, like because when you because you're funding the M17 project and like extensively funding it but let's get let's let's talk about P4DX first and then we'll get to that. Oh sure. No, the progress since since 3 years ago has been um thankfully good it's good news uh, uh large. Now not done yet but the 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 like the uh architecture has has matured by by a lot. So the basic concepts of frequency division up, meaning multiple channels and frequency up to a, a receiver in space or uh, on a mountaintop, and then that being digitized and combined in intelligent and useful ways, and then transmitted on another frequency as a single digital downlink is the same. And now we're at the point where we have uh, demonstrations and code, uh, lots of HDL code, and we're 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 moving. You know, we started out with the transmitter, which is why you see some of the beacon work on the YouTube channel. You know, so we're now at the point where we're we're setting up beacons to uh, to get people started on building up stations, so that when the entire uh, transponder system is ready, that there will be the beginnings of a, of a community. So the transmit side is coming along and I, I, I love to say it, that things are working. I mean, the, it's there and the transmit side. So the downlink side is, I'd say largely there, but it, the, it, it doesn't work until it, until it 
closes the link completely over the air. And the part that we're working on right now is the multiplexing inside uh, the, the transponder and the data link layers. Uh, so there's transport layer things that are under um, pretty rapid uh, work because we have a, a deadline. Our previous most recent deadline for demos was March uh, Ham Expo. So this previous March 2021 Ham Expo, we were able to, to demonstrate, show uh, some of the prog progress. And the next big milestone, next big set of demos is going to be in August at, at Ham Expo. So the as a raging optimist, uh, you know, I think that having the entire link from from having an uplink to the transponder, uh, and then having it appear in the downlink and and be receivable and show that as a as a demo would be wonderful. It probably won't get there, uh, just because there's there's an awful lot of coding and testing that has to happen. But you're starting to see the this big system kind of come together, and the the progress has been wonderful. We've picked up a lot of volunteers, and the volunteers we have they're from all over the world, and they're really wonderful people. It has been a real privilege and honor to work with this group. We have had some setbacks over the past year. We've had a key person uh, become very ill, and that has uh, been a been a big setback. He's a, a subject matter expert for for the protocols that we're using in the downlink. And then of course there's been COVID. And this has affected every large project, especially volunteer projects, because usually volunteer stuff is the first thing that goes and it's the last thing that comes back. We have been really fortunate here and that we've been able to keep a, a team of people together. Um, but there's a lot of people that we're looking forward to seeing again uh, when when they're able to to spend more time on on volunteer things. Well, that's unfortunately that, you know, you've had some setbacks, but I think we all have over the past 18 months or so, so uh, to be expected, I guess. And this is going to be kind of a question out of left, left field, so it may be not relevant at all. But when you were talking about this, I was, hey, it made me think of Satnogs. And do you oh, know yeah. what that is? And Absolutely. You have, yes. Satnogs you, is, uh, is we are, well, that's Space Foundation and Satnogs. And we... Absolutely love them. So Satnogs is uh, very useful to us, and we we work together with uh, as much as possible with LibreSpace on a variety of things. So we've we've collaborated back and forth, um, and and are constantly in touch. And I have a Satnogs station. Actually, I have a Satnogs station almost working. Uh, it's been uh, one of those wonderful projects, like a British sports car. It almost works and. I should probably start another Satnog station so that I'll have enough parts for the first one, sort of like a British sports car. <laughs> so that's, but you know, it's it's a fantastic, um, a fantastic project, and I'm so completely stoked to to be just a tiny part of it as a participant. And so our goal is to have the the radios that we do uh, to be useful. You know, some of the components to be useful to to add microwave capability to to Satnogs easily. Um, so we're constantly talking about about that and, and it's in in our minds to include that uh, at the very least as a model for, for some of the components uh, that we uh, that we develop and, and publish. Well, I feel so good that wasn't as far out of left field as I thought it was. <laughs> no, no, not no, not left field <laughs> at all. All right, excellent. So what's what's like near term development roadmap look like for phase four? Let's see. What do we have? What did I say we were going to do this week? I made some statements. Well, we need to pay attention to the uplink amplifier. Um, and so I, I made some noises about that. There's some dual band feed because we, we are trying to do all this uh, in one dish. The uplink is on 5 gigahertz. The downlink is on 10 the other band plan that we're looking at and, and trying to enable with some core tech is 10 gigahertz up and 24 gigahertz down. And so in both of those cases, we have uh, with um, with Paul Wade, uh, W1GHZ's efforts, uh, solid, wonderful dual band feeds so that you need one dish and one feed. And we've achieved that. Uh, but the next part is to is to take those feeds and then get them working with electronics really close to the feed. Uh, so this means like take a maybe an LNB and bring it closer to that. Uh, so those are the sorts of sorts of next steps for that 
on the digital side in the transponder itself, the uh, we use something called generic stream encapsulation, which is a it's just it, it is actually self descriptive. Uh, it's generic stream encapsulation. So any digital signal, any packet packetized signal, can be transferred over the DVB-S2 uh, signal that we're using. Now, usually DVB-S2, which is often used in amateur television, uh, you know, and, and it's common in amateur radio, usually DVB-S and DVB-S2 use MPEG as the transport layer, you know, so the video signal MPEG. This has a lot of overhead. And so from the beginning, we were like, okay, we'll take the MPEG out and we'll drop in GSE, generic stream encapsulation. And then you just get a big, nice pipe. You, you, claw back some of this mechanisms. It's more efficient, less overhead. And that is finally coming along uh, and we'll be able to not just have a a, a one-off, very isolated demo like we did at GNU Radio Conference, but we'll be able to transmit over the air using GSE. And we're looking at putting that into the beacon. So now this does make it a little harder for an amateur operator or experimenter to receive the signal because usually off the shelf, the thing will only understand MPEG. And so part of the, our challenge is to get GSE uh, in wide in widespread use. It's a superior thing for amateur radio, so it's it's the right direction. Um, and so there will be some, some work reviewed over the next week or so for the GSE implementations. And so that's coming along. The underlying stuff for DVB-S2 and S2X, the extension, um, is looking pretty good. That still needs a lot of testing, validation, and verification. And that's that's coming up pretty soon, too. And that's that's the highlights, I think. There's a ton of other things that are more logistics. Um, and then there's a lot of regulatory work going on, but in terms of the technical side, those pieces are are the things that are coming up next. All right, very good. I I don't have anywhere to go from there, honestly. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I I don't know enough about the Phase Four project. I've I've seen the little you know snippets you put up on doing the beacons and stuff, and uh, that's about all I understand of it. Well, that's yeah. All we've done is we've taken a, a protocol and and cut it up, and divided you know divide and conquer. And you know each each piece that we're able to to make progress on is then tested. It's sort of like unit testing. You know, you test your your or you test a function, and then it gets to join the rest of the code. You know, so the things I'm talking about are chunks. They're like major, you know, big chunks of the of the project, and we are. We're coming to the point where we're starting to integrate more and more of that, so it's an exciting time. All right, fantastic. Well, we should probably move this on to the second bullet point Bill put in here, which is something we're a little bit more familiar with because we have just recently talked with and uh, had great conversations with the folks at M17. And speaking of developing protocols and DSP and all kinds of audio stuff and getting things uh, transmitted with packets over the air, terrestrially and uh, potentially um, orbitally. Uh, the M17 project is one we've been talking about, and you guys are definitely involved with that. And I'm going to let Bill handle this part so I can stop talking for a little bit. Um, but go ahead and, uh, first of all, tell us um, how you came to be involved with M17 and uh, what you guys are doing together. Oh, sure. Yeah, about a, I want to say about a year ago, uh, one of the – Core volunteers um, in the, who is in the space industry, um, a principal engineer in the space industry, wrote me and said, "Hey, have you heard about this M17 project? I think this would be an excellent one to reach out to, collaborate to, and this protocol looks like it's what we need to be using for our uplink. So for the uplink, for us, we we're looking at, we we're like, well, we looked around and we just didn't see anything." that could be easily adapted. And we didn't want to just use some sort of analog, you know, FM or whatever. So no, the doubling needs to be digital in order to enable all this really cool stuff and to take advantage of, you know, so many, there's lots and lots of good reasons. And we're like, well, you know, so we started working on our own protocol and that's, yeah, you know, it's okay. But, but when we saw the M17 protocol work and the the project, even at that stage, it was really good. And reading through all the documents that they had on the website and 
it became it was like this is really a, not just a wonderful project but this is so very useful and it, and we just could not agree with them more and it it was um it was a good process so the we we reached out and eventually we um became the fiscal sponsor for for M17 for them to get a grant from ARDC which is just a, it's a highlight of of the year for for us uh and we'll make you know the funding will make a substantial difference in the development and success of M17 so we started out thinking of of just using the protocol you know just adopting it and using it and now it's just a, such a huge privilege to be able to support them and to help them achieve these goals for something to come along like this open specification every open source code you know open hardware open algorithms you know it's fantastic it's it's well done layered um there will be some changes for space we we know we have to make some changes to the to the version that's that's developed for terrestrial and in talking with them 17 we think that the terrestrial versions should stay the same like we should not try to overload it or you know so we'll, there will be a space version and there will be a a terrestrial version that that everyone's probably much more familiar with and the major difference is is just the physical layer has to change in order to adapt to space links and the requirements for microwave and the broader bandwidth that we're using so it's it's been great. There will be over the next year. Um, there will be some some. I, I am looking forward to some some significant steps forward for for M seventeen, and uh, cannot wait. So we can see that this is going to probably impact for sure the RF side of things. Which I guess when we talked to them, they were saying that 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 part is slightly behind in development and stuff like that. Um, actually, having you know full blown hardware. And everything else uh, for M17. Yeah, I I think it's probably that's probably fair to say. Although I mean, you know, being biased and everything, I would. <laughs> I think it's all gonna be software. Is, that's it. Yeah, Just software. Well, right? <laughs> it's so tempting. It is very tempting to say that. And you know, I know enough about RF hardware design to be dangerous. And you know, my background is the math and the zeros and the ones and the baseband and all that, you know, nasty little math stuff. But the, you know, they have a similar sort of situation in that the, you have to pay attention to all of the the links and the protocol and get that right. And then, you know, it's like, oh, well, you know, the hardware should be off the shelf commodities. And then you find out it's it's really kind of not. So the recent funding, um, the very first thing or Maybe not the very first thing, but but the first uh, major kind of thought out purchases were to address uh, evaluating the RF hardware performance. And there's been a lot of work recently on that. Then things are getting on the air. There's a repeater on the air. More and more people are trying it out. Uh, lots more clients, lots more hardware. So it's it's going to come along and if it hasn't already, if it's not already well on its way to kind of catching up to the rest of the project, then it soon will. Right, and as you mentioned, the uh, the M seventeen for satellites, you know, to keep it simple, <laughs> would be slightly different. Um, is this is this grant also going to be kind of used to work on that, or is that just a totally separate type of uh, volunteer type project that you guys are working on in house? Oh, or that's with a good the M17 question. M17 people, or yeah, I just don't know. Like, how does the oh, money yeah. get translated into either purchases, or is it going to, you know, fund developers, or you know, what what is actually funding? Yeah, that's a, that's a that's a really good uh, a good question. The so M17 has their own separate bank account. So all the different projects uh, that we that we have have a separate separate bank account, and in the for the most part have separate sources of of funding. Now the vast majority of the funding is coming from ARDC. Um, if you're uh, if you're not familiar, this is a, a very large uh, philanthropic organization that is funded from uh, a partial sale of the 44 block IP addresses uh, originally assigned to amateur radio. And these proceeds, this was made a made a lot of money and the proceeds are being used to fund open source amateur radio projects or things that will help uh, amateur radio uh, scholarships infrastructure 
um, R and D like like what we do. And so M seventeen applied for for a grant, and in their grant they lay out a, a wide variety of things. So that's what their money is used for, and that's where it will go. So any expenses that are required to adapt the M seventeen protocol would would come from phase four ground or in space that would come from like p 40 x and we budgeted for uplink uh, hardware software uh, co-development you know and and all those all the expenses of that so what we've done is reached out and and met with the principal people in in m17 that are that are working on uh, the this particular part the protocol part and the there was tons of enthusiasm from both sides and it's so far so good. We are working together to figure out uh, what to do. And so if there is any cost for this variant, the space side, then that would fall under the the transponder work in, in P40X. It will not burden or distract or harm M17 in any, any way. That's, that's my goal is to make sure that that, that happens. Uh, so they're advising us. And then what we'll do is we'll take the protocol and go brick it. And then come back and say, "What happened? Do you need to help us out? You know, we, we bricked it." So, you know, the, in other words, totally normal engineering is is happening. Yeah, so that's good. So it made made the project very compatible to you, and then you know, you also be able to help them be in that uh, uh, not benefactor, but yeah, sponsor of the actual uh, grant uh, since they're not a. Form, formed as a nonprofit, right? The M17 right. project, yeah. Yes, but yeah. They that's haven't quite kinda, got there yet, <laughs> right? That's kind of, and that's kind of the thing with with um with grants from private foundations like ARDC is that they're restricted. They can't give it to individuals or groups that aren't a 501c3. And there may be some exceptions and some edge cases in the law, and you know, but in general, somebody has to have the the status, like someone has to stand up and say, I, I volunteer to be the fiscal sponsor for this particular project. And one of the, my, um, goals, I, I guess I, I hesitate to say one of my goals for M17 because I want to be very respectful that of this amazing project that has achieved all of this on its, on its own. You know, my job is to remove roadblocks and to provide resources and to, encourage them if they want to incorporate become a 501c3 or something like that to support them and to uh, to make that happen as easily as possible so if that's the path uh, that they eventually want to take to become a, a, a you know a formal open source organization then I think that's that's awesome and whenever they're ready to take that step then we will be with them a hundred percent until then if you know they well, all we do is make sure that they have a 501c3 and make sure that the any roadblocks that we can help remove are removed and any resources they need are are yeah that's that's great and yeah especially for small projects like that um which can, could have a really huge impact especially for amateur radio it's great it's great that there's uh you know places like you guys that can help them out <laughs> and, yeah and can help yeah. them get the resources they need that maybe they don't know how to get you know kind of like a you know almost like vc funding right you know you're trying to get from that uh you know 1x to 10x and you know how am i going to get to 100x you know what what how do we how do we make these determinations to to uh bring the projects to the next level or get them, you know, at least uh, to a, a level at which adoption is, is going to be something more attainable and stuff like that. Right. Yeah. Fundraising can be so incredibly hard. It's really difficult to do fundraising on top of organizing, you know, essentially being a community organizer, a volunteer coordinator, uh, an engineering or subject matter expert, uh, pro also doing software development. <laughs> and then, a lot of people are doing this in their spare time. So, it, you know, it, I'm, it's, it's an honor to be able to help out in any way. The projects that are, that are out there um, that are doing this amazing work and to be able to help with, with funding is a, is a joy. Yeah, absolutely. And, you know, obviously uh, the ARDC is out there giving money away. <laughs> that, yes. If you don't know about them and please go check out ampr.org. Uh, ARDC. Um, and if you know of a project that you think deserves a grant, please tell them, 
tell the project to apply, we we will it, we'll find a way uh, because there, not everything can be solved with money, but you know it doesn't suck, and you know and there's there's a sometimes lot. it makes it easier to solve it. <laughs> yes, yes. Sometimes it makes it so much easier, and sometimes it's not a it may not be a six figure thing that a project needs. It may just be a couple hundred, couple thousand would make all the difference. Or just you know, just some advice, uh, a, a, a you know, contract, a, maybe some legal work, maybe something like that. You know, it's it's there, and we're we're just so incredibly fortunate in amateur radio to have this fund available for this sort of work. It is, uh, I, you know, it's an amazing thing that's happened, and you know, we should all sort of do our best to sort of look around and say what could what could get funded that would really change amateur radio and and try to 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 get the uh you know get some attention on on the on that work on those projects because they're out there you know github is littered with with projects i mean not every good idea turns into a project and not every project (laughs) is a good idea but we all know those those really special projects that have resilience and and are great and that they need maybe just need just need a little bit of help a little nudging yeah i mean you know even the small grant that the uh the ambassad uh inspired sensors got back in september what last year yeah uh, 4200 bucks you know it's yep. like it, it just needed it for a very specific project right and you apply for it and and there it is you know that's that's great that it's you know any amount and if you if you go on their site right now you'll see one for 1.6 million to MIT right exactly <laughs> which is huge <laughs> so it goes from small <laughs> to huge yes and uh yeah you know, definitely looking at the projects that they that they've been doing you know funding and stuff like that you know obviously a lot of good good depth there so and it's great that you guys have been able to you know uh obtain funding through that source as well because that's probably a, a much deeper deeper pocket source than <laughs> than uh you know hitting uh hitting the campaign trail and, and oh, yeah. individuals and stuff like that it is it's it's we we had done a lot of fundraising on our own but we were looking at years to get to the phase one of out of three of the tech, you know, when you break down your project, like the the way that the, for example, the NSF breaks down projects into phases. And so, you know, those of us that were familiar with this project, you split the project up into these phases. You're looking at like three or four years to raise the money just to do phase one. And it's a lot of hard work, like selling conference badges and having bake sales and, uh, you know, and you're like, you're making progress, but it's 18 months, two years, you know. So the length of time that it takes to raise money is a factor because eventually people wander off because it's like we're fundraising and fundraising and fundraising and we're never going to, you know, you never really get to spend it because you don't have enough to really start. And you know, for, for projects that are that are that are that know what they're doing or at least have a clue, you know, willing to take the risk and, and organized enough and can present a, a decent grant, then this is absolutely game changing to have this fund in our field. It's huge. It will this will over time this will make uh, this will change amateur radio uh, in in a, I think in a dramatic way. It will it will. Ch- it will start making some significant changes in the in the culture by enabling um you know projects yeah yeah for sure um so uh let's see we got the is there, did you want to mention anything else about the ambassad uh, project specifically yeah it's a tricky one it's a ambassad is a existing funded uh project and it's a tiny satellite uh very small um, smaller than one U. And so it's, it's a very lightweight. And what it has on it, when you, when you, when you get one, you can buy one. Um, they offer you a, a launch. There's always a launch right in the future. It's been slipped a couple of times. Um, but you know, they, they say you can launch the Ambisat and it, and you can then track your satellite as it goes around in low Earth orbit. And it pings away and it uses something called the Things Network. Uh, uses LoRa, but it uses it on the ISM bands, industrial science and, and medical bands. These are unlicensed bands, and 
um, it was controversial from the very, very beginning because this choice of band means that you don't have a globally assigned frequency. There's 915 in the United States and 868 in Europe and 866, I think it's 867 in India. And well, how in the world is your little satellite going to know which thing to legally transmit on? And therefore, getting a license to go uh, from the FCC for, for this to, to go into space has proven to be problematic. So what do you do? Well, it's open source. So you can take the entire design and go, okay, what can we do to make this easier to, to license? Or, uh, you know, what, what can we do? Can we, can we put it on maybe a microwave frequency instead, you know, uh, instead of, you know, 900 or 800? And so that's what the Ambisat inspired sensors started out with. Okay. We're going to make the sensors. We're going to do a, a family of sensors that attach to the original Ambisat. Once it became clear that there was a licensing challenge, um, we then said, okay, it's now going, we're now addressing the entire satellite, not just the little sensors. You, you, you can order a variety of sensors and they, they, uh, I put a connector on mine, but, but when you solder it up for space, it's, it's flat. Uh, but there's a variety of sensors. There's UV light sensors and, you know, so like six different types of, of things. So you, it's a, it's sort of a user swap out sort of thing you can choose. Um, and so originally we were limited, we limited ourselves to, to, um, to make a new family of open source sensors. Now the neat thing about Ambisat is that it's not just useful for space. This design is so small and lightweight that it can go on a balloon. This is a really, really good candidate for balloon launches and you can, I mean, hey, you know, I mean, that's that's a good educational thing that is uh, very popular in amateur radio, very popular in STEM. So this is a great platform for that. Um, I'm currently using an Ambisat to monitor my greenhouse, so I threw it out there, and it monitors light levels and and other things. Um, it it has a lot of potential outside of accessibility. You know, it's it is a very inexpensive. You know, compared to other satellites, is a very inexpensive board. It has a whole lot of utility outside of the, just this one. Put your your particular thing in space and and talk to the things network. So there was some scope creep. I think it's fair to say on this particular uh, project. Um, but if all goes well, we'll be presenting uh, a lot of work in August at Ham Expo. Interesting, interesting. Um, so uh, you. Kind of briefly talked about the uh, the Aquaphage project as yes. well in your yes. opening. Are you, can you give us some more details on that one as well? Yeah, that one is uh, so bacteriophages are viruses that attack bacteria, and about a hundred years ago they were uh, under very active study, and then antibiotics kind of took over. So instead of culturing bacteriophage, um, so each each bug, bad bug, has a has a good bug that kind of goes after it. Uh, so, you know, th it was, well, if you have a particular type of bacterial infection, then, then you can get these, this particular, um, you know, virus and, and, uh, and it's a therapy. Okay. So, so antibiotics kind of replaced that. And we, we now we fast forward about a hundred years and we have a big problem with uh, antibiotic resistant bacteria. So, Bacteriophages are now coming back around to be studied, and uh, I'm in San Diego, so I'm, I'm fortunate. There's a, a, a institute here that studies uh, bacteriophages. It started, it was up and running, and then COVID put everything on hiatus. So we ramped up with aquaphage, and it's called aquaphage because our our particular problem that we wanted to tackle is bacteria, uh, antibiotic resistant bacteria in fish farms. So tilapia suffer from two or three uh, different particular bacterial infections. And we think that if you could use bacteriophage uh, to attack these, to keep fish farms uh, much cleaner, rather than carpet bombing them with, with antibiotics, if you use sort of the, the natural enemy of the bacteria, that that would be great. And that helps everybody because fish farms are all over the world and a lot of protein comes out of fish farms. So this seemed like a, 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 a and that, that makes sense just from a, maybe a target perspective or a medical perspective or, you know, food, public health sort of perspective. But why in the world would you, would an open source, you know, group want to tackle it? And the reason is, is that we, we believe that this is a very good 
area for open source to kind of step up and say, hey, you know, since bacteriophage research and development has been around for so long, why don't we take a, a fresh perspective? Why don't we look at this and do this as an open source thing? And so this particular problem in and with IPATH in, at UCSD, um, let's see what the open source community can accomplish. You know, can we get uh, an open source mindset, open process, open science, you know, uh, open access to research? Can we get those concepts going sort of from a from the beginning of this resurgence in in bacteriophage uh, R&D? And so that's the that was that's the goal of of that particular effort. So everything was ramping up. It was very early in the process. We're talking to different uh, chemists and and different biologists and looking at what it would take to get a lab. Um, and then that got put on hold because of COVID. So when we start to meet again, when IPATH, the institute at UCSD that does bacteriophage research, when they get back up and running, then we will renew those conversations and see what happens. Um, so arguably kind of a tougher nut to crack than to implement a, a open source hardware or software design where we do have a culture of open source, where we do have licenses. Um, some of it's messy, true, but we have a, a you know, decades of tradition of open source in especially software and, and now growing a mountain hardware, not so much in, in biomedical research. So if all we do is make the errors in bacteriophage R&D think about it, then I'm going to say that that's, we, we will have made an impact and, and, and that will be a success. Um, you know, even if we only do the very basics of lab work uh, and and you know get into it uh, from from a, a, a low level, even if we we don't pull off the sorts of things that we're uh, looking at in terms of fish farming success, you know, just having the dialogue and getting the concept introduced to um, you know researchers that that are solidly sort of in the commercial mindset even if we just start the conversation then then I'll be extraordinarily happy yeah it's hard to separate out the uh uh the monetization of the the medical industry <laughs> uh and, true and, it and is get those, get those pieces apart uh cuz you know they're you know kind of like consultants the drug drug industry you know they there's money to be made in prolonging the problem that's you know, true. So. And just like, <laughs> like just, we don't want to just, solve anything. <laughs> right. And just like we've seen with Internet, it, with the Internet in general, you know, if if you're a company, I don't know how to say this without being. I'm not, I'm not going to. It's not really. It's, it's kind of problematic in a way, but, like, but open source makes lots of money for people like we have the, some of the very largest tech companies in the world have. Are, are that huge, like Facebook and Google and Amazon and et cetera, et cetera. Th this, this is enabled by open source. So open source lets you focus on things that differentiate your business. They let you focus on your secret sauce. And then the rest of it can be solid, dependable, worked out stuff that is in either the public domain or is licensed open source. And there's so much siloing in medicine. There's so many wheels reinvented. And there's so many things that... Is if it turns out to be a failure, it's never published. So it, they only publish the successes, and there's a huge bias there. I think if we could get a little bit of headway in there and make some progress there, that I think we could start to 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 make an economic argument that you know it, you're not just what well, what do you want me to do? Give away my product for free? Well, no, that's not it. You know, so those all those conversations are 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 in the very beginnings in this particular area. So, yeah, and like, like I said, much harder nut to crack than figuring out you know <laughs> the math behind a forward error correct why your forward error correction isn't working or you know trying trying to get waveforms to behave. So it 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 is hard, but it's the sort of thing that that the the you know, that ORI people are motivated to tackle. Yeah, that's very interesting. So let's see. One other project you guys had listed here was the open cars, but you said that one's currently on a hiatus on the website. Let's see. Yeah, that one. Yeah, that one was one that was um, spearheaded by Bruce Perrins. And the the goal there was to to open up 
uh, cars. So with especially with self-driving cars, a lot of proprietary technology and your life depends on it. And so that was uh, a paper, some legal, a little bit of legal work and a, and a, and a paper addressing the legal work, which is should that all that should be, should be on the website or in a repos and then a conference. So Bruce tried to, to put together uh, a conference to, to start working on this. Um, and it got a lot of, got a lot of interest and there were people that were going to come to the conference, but the opposition was also very, very strident. Um, so this is a very controversial, uh, sort of area it turned out. And so that got put on hold because the path forward didn't look clear that, you know, and it's like, you have to have somebody that's going to talk to you, you know, and, and is, is, is going to agree. Yes, this should be open source. Um, and so I don't know with open cars, I think there was a, there's a, there was a deal of success. There was a measure of success in raising the issue and other organizations and other people also raised the issue. And there was later on a couple of years later, there did appear to be some amount of, okay, fine. You know, we'll, we have to start sharing our code base because accidents happen, you know, and how do you investigate pr proprietary code? How? I mean, it's a it's an amazingly interesting part of technology that affects all of us. Even if you don't have a self driving car, you're on the road with them. So, you know, an open source approach allows for safer code, for higher quality code, and that that was the the arg that was the beginning of the of the technology argument. And so it's a uh, that one I would say is definitely on hiatus and. You know, if Bruce wanted to come back and work on that again, it'd be great. Um, and we would back it 100% or anybody else that wanted to, to pick that up. It's a tough yeah. one, though. It's a hard one because yeah. you're dealing with companies that are very secure in their proprietary <laughs> nature. <laughs> and they're, yeah, so it's a, it's a tough one. You know, well, it's it's almost it's uh, it's almost the same as like the right to repair stuff. You yes, know? it's like do uh, yeah. you own it or do you own the use of it, uh, kind yeah. of thing. And it's like it's it's something that's going to have to go through court battles before you know there could be any foundation because I think the ship is sort of sort of sailed here on uh, on that, and all we can do is have a conversation until we have some sort of legal battle that uh, is funded well enough to uh, actually get that to occur much like the right to repair stuff is slowly go, you know creeping through the courts that's an excellent comparison and point once in a while I'm, i have good thoughts <laughs> 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 uh, and there was one topic that uh, i can't remember i was trying to go back on my notes and find the context of it but you and steve cuz we had steve conklin on here before with you yeah. Like during that episode, you guys talked about fashion freedom. What was that about the fashion freedom initiative? Oh yeah, that's it, it's his um his wife Sue leads the fashion that's freedom right. institute. Yes. <laughs> yes, and that has that is still um a still going ongoing. it's still ongoing, still making progress. Uh, she recently won um uh some sort of major award, so I think you should totally ask her to like well, I don't know like if you want to talk about fashion but you know <laughs> fashion wear wearables work something in with like you know amateur radio wearables in the fashion I don't know but it's, it's fascinating work you know and it's that's big game hunting too because the fashion industry is full of extremely large wealthy proprietary organizations that really ha are very confident in that They've got the world by the tail and, you know, whole uh, kind of opening up, um, you know, doing open source fashion, all, you know, from from top to bottom, the dis from the design of the clothing to all the way through to how it's made on what machines, you know, because very mechanized, um, you know, all over the world to, you know, what happens to all the waste. Um, so so her work is is pretty amazing. It's she's taking on some some big challenges and making progress. Well, that's awesome. That's awesome. Yeah. We'll have to get a hold of Steve and his wife and, and talk about that. That's, that's, <laughs> that's definitely something for another night. Um, Russ, 
yeah uh, wake you up there in your <laughs> chair in missouri uh what what's what else uh what else can you think of what is kind of mind in our conversation so far that you want to add to I'm not sure that anything has really. I've really been enjoying listening to this for a change and not having to think about what my next question is <laughs> and just kind of actually <laughs> being able to like imbibe all this, this uh, fire hose of information. It's been fantastic. And actually you're getting uh, quite a few thumbs up in the chat about the same thing. So, Aww. uh, yeah, I don't, I don't have any additional questions. I, I pretty much understood everything we've talked about. Um, I love the fact that we've gone from satellite technology to new sound, you know, audio protocols to better tasting tacos. Um, <laughs> sort, sort of runs the gamut of how the show usually goes. So, <laughs> um, yeah, I don't really have much. Uh, we can look at the chat room and see if that they have anything. And while we're waiting for any questions to come out of the uh, our peanut gallery. We we generally ask if there's anything that you know we didn't touch on that you wanted to touch on. I know we talked about several of the ORIs associated projects and things you guys are interested in and, and have a hand in. But did did we pass over anything, or is there something you wanted to embellish on uh, before we wrap oh, this yeah. up? Oh yeah, yeah. I was gonna I was gonna say no, but I it just it occurred to me. So one of the the things that that ARDC grant enabled. Um, that we would not have been able to do without the funding is to fund two um, digital communications labs with some, some really nice test equipment that this is just something in the amateur community. You know, if you're, if you're in a microwave or, you know, or even if you're just in amateur radio, there's, there's, there usually is like somebody has some test equipment. Gather it. Somebody has a garage full of like cool surplus gear, or you know they just happen to have enough money to 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 get the gear. And that means that that those of us that live in larger cities have this enormous advantage, right? Because there's usually some you know a microwave group in a city, and it's oftentimes it has a, has a lab or somebody that can loan out equipment or test the stuff. Otherwise, it's really hard to make sure it works. And so w one of the things that we, we set out to do from the beginning was to have a lab that you could access remotely as much as possible. There's a lot of things you can't do remotely in a lab, but we wanted to, to make that happen. And two, we have two labs right now. One's in uh, Florida. And, and one's in San Diego. And the one in Florida is, uh, well, it, it's, it's a remarkable story. We, we got hit by a hurricane and then we had a fire at the site. Um, and that, and that we're waiting on locusts and, um, you know, I, it's, so <laughs> cicadas so, are going to get the next, right? <laughs> oh, the cicadas. And we had those. Oh my gosh. There's going to be an eclipse. Things will go dark. I mean, it's, it's, so that one's not exactly up and running, but, uh, we, actively working with that team and they're the ones that that kind of inspired us and helped us to figure out some of the networking problems for san diego so the san diego lab is up and running so it's we call them remote labs and the list of test equipment is in the repo and we are here there's human people here at the labs um there's three of us uh that can come in and do uh, or have overlapping skills and you can log in to the main central lab computer and you can have your own VM and you can run any of the test equipment. And this includes very large FPGA development boards that are just not priced for hobbyists or researchers or amateurs in any way. But we are, we have some. So like uh, Xilinx Ultrascale uh, and the 7000 series and analog devices, um, RFICs, things like that. So you want to do you, you want to dive into FPGAs, always wanted to learn. We want you to be able to do that. So the remote labs are an aspect of, of ORI. It's a community resource. It's set up mainly for, uh, for digital communications at microwave. Um, but it's, it's pretty flexible lab, you know, so it's, it's not, I don't think it's, it's not too narrowly focused. We have all the usual test equipment for, for, for microwave and FPGA design. Uh, digital stuff and M M17 project is also going to have a lab as well. They're focusing uh, a little more on RF and uh, in interference mitigation to make really good, reliable, nice hardware. Uh, a little lower in frequency, so talking like VHF, UHF. So the the, uh, the remote labs, 
that are coming up uh, that are accessible anywhere from for, to anyone uh, on the internet. Uh, there, there's always a learning curve with stuff like this. So, you know, it will take uh, some time to kind of adjust, but we're, what we're trying to do is make it as easy as we possibly can. Um, so yeah, that's, that's one of the aspects of, of what we do uh, that we're trying very hard to make this uh, available to the community, regardless of, of where you live. Oh, very good. And Tony in the chat room wants to know if you can visit the San Diego location. Yes, you can. It is in a resident. <laughs> it's, it's in a, our, the one in San Diego is in a residence and the one in Florida is in a, a warehouse slash business. Um, but both of them you can visit. So it's just getting in touch and make an appointment and, and come and, and see. Uh, so they have dedicated rooms and, and we're, we're at the point where it's going to have to be dedicated power as well. Cause if you turn everything on, then I think we're out of power. <laughs> it's, it's, so it's, it's enough equipment to where you kind of have to, you're looking at the breaker, the breaker's sweating, you know, so, so that's the next, one of the next, next phases is to, to make sure that, that it has a, a little bit better infrastructure to support it. And Frank wants to know how many ground stations are there? How many ground, oh, it depends on like how, how complete or how baked you want your ground station. So, I mean, as a, as an engineering sort of management person, I would say that we really only have like three that are anywhere close to being done. Um, and that's, but that's a, a, speak, a raging optimist. There's lots and lots of parts to them. The basic part of, of the ground station though is pretty easy to, to do. All you have to do is, uh, is look at what like QO100 people are doing for their, for the, at least for the receive side for their ground station. So, you know, if you, if you kind of relax the requirements and it's like, well, you know, our ground station just want to receive some sort of signal. And, and we do have a growing number of signals in our, in our category. Uh, CATSAT is going up, I believe, next year. Uh, from uh, Arizona, so this is a, a, a Arizona project, a URC project that is going to transmit on, on 10 gigahertz DVBS2. So we're very excited. We're starting to see, you know, we coordinate and, and, and work work with them, and have helped answer some questions. There's an, another uh, project that is launched that is has similar uh, band plan. Uh, we didn't know about them until they filed with the IARU, but but it's they cited our, uh, the, our, the, our existence as a reason why uh, DVBS2 on 10 gig was selected. Um, so if you just want to receive, you can make a ground station pretty easily. Um, you know, if you want to transmit, then a little bit more work. So like the, the RF side for the 5 gigahertz uplink is, has been lagging for quite a while with its penciled in is using, you know, parts from so-and-so company. Uh, but we do not have anything more than than breadboards or kits from W1 GHZ. So those are those are uh, that's another population of boards that you can use to put together a station. Nothing off the shelf yet. Uh, we still have an agreement with Flex Radio to help make hardware when it's designed, um, and we keep in touch with them and they help advise on on hardware issues uh, every now and then. So a huge support from them. Does that kind of answer the question? It's kind of a messy question because it's Kind of a messy answer. I mean, oh, sorry. It was a messy answer, not a messy question at all. It's a totally awesome. <laughs> I just realized well, what I said. I'm very, he, very sorry, <laughs> questioner. <laughs> he he uh, told us that he understood exactly what you said. So, oh, wow. But, okay. Thank you. <laughs> I, I and, like, um, I I like my... the questioner. That's that's a very wonderful thing to hear. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> I think my last question is, you're a raging optimist and a raging uh, extrovert. So we're, yeah. why, why for all the rage? <laughs> <laughs> Only it's, 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 it's the nice, it's nice version of, of rage. It's enthusiastic okay. rage, not, not, ang not, not necessarily angry. All right. Well, I'm, I'm out of questions. Bill, you got anything else you want to wrap up with before we ask her to uh, mention all yeah. the projects we need to? Because uh, I want to, you don't have to give us like websites or anything like that. But if you've got like a GitHub repo or all these projects, we'll look them up and put links in the show notes. We've got a few of them already, but we definitely want to mention everything that you covered and that people should be looking into that the ORI has a hand in. But we'll let Bill ask his question because I think I'm rambling. Go for it. 
Yeah, yeah. I just had one more thing, and I know my delay is getting off because you guys are out of sync with my headset. <laughs> so <laughs> I'm sure I'll mess everything up here. But anyway, uh, I did want to mention and talk uh, just briefly about uh, you guys have just started doing some uh, updated uh, content, I guess, on your YouTube channel. And I noticed you have two uh, office hour recordings, uh, which kind of have like team meetings and stuff like that. Are you going to continue to put those out on YouTube for everyone to uh to consume and should people kind of go and look there for kind of like the inside track of what's going on with the teams? Yes. Yeah, we do as much as we can. And, um, you know, just, I, 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 the, like, yes. Okay. Yeah. That's, that's a solid 100% enthusiastic. Yes. It's a raging. Yes. That's right. Yes. Yeah, a raging. Yes. Yeah, absolutely. We, <laughs> we definitely try to put, um, yeah, you know, cause I, I started out, this was I, I knew better. I started out going, okay, we're going to do a weekly engineering report on on Fridays. Never name something weekly. <laughs> don't do it. Just don't do it. It's, then you have to do it. Yeah. Yeah, because like you know, anybody can see that there are gaps in this in this scheme. So you know. So I, but yes, we we want to have uh, as many presentations as possible uh, in the you know the, the, with formal presentations, things that we do at conferences and things like that. Uh, now will be on the the ORI um, YouTube. Before it was hosted by individual members of the team. Like some you know Steve would put stuff on his YouTube, and I would have stuff on mine. And it kind of occurred to us that like. You know, having a central place might be a really good idea. So, so that's that's what we that's what we did with the channel. So that's where all of the the project stuff will go, uh, lab walkthroughs or demos or you know this this weird thing happened. Look at this or you know the uh, or the team meetings uh, when there when there's a summit or when there's a decision. Um, what we'll probably do is. Uh, you know, tried to do some more weekly reports like we did with the where it was a weekly video report at the end of the week. Uh, so there's some that are there, uh, but we'll we'll keep at it. Awesome. Yeah, that looks really good. That's uh, good content. Yeah, that's all I had. I think okay. this was great. This is a great uh, a great update. Oh, on, thank you. Uh, no, the it's status really, of everything. Yeah, it's really good to hear the feedback because you know it, it, sometimes it can be hard to tell that you know you when you put you're putting content like as you know you put content out there and. Uh, so, so your feedback is very valuable. We'll we'll keep at it. Fantastic. Well, I don't have anything else. I think we've we've uh, named all the projects. We've named the websites. We've got your YouTube channel. Links to all of that stuff will be in the show notes. Is there anything you want to mention specifically that may be like ancillary to any of the projects or the ORI that you might want to direct people to, or have we pretty much covered it? Oh, it's a it's a it's a giant ball of of ancillary it's all it's miscellaneous all the way down it's on some days no the the um the website is open research dot institute and that's that'll that should have links to to almost everything and that's a, a great place to go if you know of a project that might want to uh that might want to might need some help from from ori in any way then there's a uh, a link for for how to uh how to what, to t what do we need to know about your project? And then there's a, a link for how to get started as an individual if you would like to kind of join up. If you, it, j hey, if you just want to keep up with what we're doing, uh, or if you want to to become a contributor or participant, uh, either way, uh, you're welcome. Uh, so there's a the link on the website that shows uh, how to do that. All right, fantastic. I think we've covered everything we need to cover. So I guess we will just say thank you, Michelle, for coming back on the show and updating us on all the great things the ORI is doing and has a part of. And uh, we're looking forward to the advancement of uh, all these things, uh, especially the M17 project, which is uh, sort of something we've fallen into or uh, become closely affiliated with. So uh, those guys are doing a lot of great work and kudos to them for doing something as ambitious as creating a new protocol out of whole cloth. I mean, yeah. <laughs> Uh, not something people just usually say, wake up in the morning and say, oh, I'm going to do this today. Uh, but Wojciech did that, and uh, here we are now. <laughs> so uh, so thanks, uh, Michelle. Uh, N5, or see, no, yeah, it's W5NYV. 
You gotta clean my glasses, right? <laughs> yeah, thank you so much. This has been super fun, and I'm really looking forward. Uh, I hope I'll hope I can come back and uh, tell you about all all the things that are that are going to happen. I, I can't wait. Well, wait about three and a half years, and we'll yeah. be back. <laughs> <laughs> I will do my best. <laughs> All right. Fantastic. Thanks for coming, uh, being on the show with us tonight, and we hope you have a great evening, and we will definitely keep in touch. Thank you. All right. So we do have a couple of quick pieces of feedback we're going to get to here before we wrap up the show. Uh, first one, I'll just go through this real quick, and then we'll bring Cheryl on to do the last one because she hasn't been doing anything for the last hour and some. Uh, are you going to say that you are doing something? No, she's probably like, my phones, my headphones aren't working anymore. No, they're working. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, the first bit of feedback we have is from Matt, who is the podcaster over at a podcast called Libre Quest, which he sent in all lowercase to me. So I thought it was Libre Quest at the, <laughs> when I first read it. <laughs> Um, but it's actually Lee Breakwest when I went to the website to check it out. And he wanted to know if we were going to actually have T-shirts for sale at some point. And I told him we would. We just need to find a decent place to get T-shirts made at that don't cost a fortune so that when we want to sell them to you, we don't have to charge you a fortune. Um, it's kind of hard to do that because we generally do short runs. And people who make T-shirts don't like doing short runs, so they charge you way too much. But... Uh, you know, we're working on it. If anybody has any ideas, I mean, we're, we're trying local and, you know, online services and stuff like that. So if anybody has a good idea where you can get T-shirts and short runs that don't cost a fortune, uh, shoot them our way. <laughs> but uh, either way, we will have some T-shirts at some point. Um, and now we can bring Cheryl on, who can read all of this Hawaiian. Yay. <laughs> because I am so good at it. <laughs> I, I did this on purpose, and you know I did. So yeah, I know you did. So our next, and I can't, I can't not see, I can't see the word Kamehameha without thinking of Cartman. So if anybody, <laughs> if anybody's ever seen or heard South Park uh, and King Kamehameha, you know exactly what I'm talking about. But anyway, go for it. <laughs> okay, our next little email is from Michael Miller, KH six ML. He says, "Aloha, John. Can we ask for your kokua? I'm assuming that's how that's pronounced, which is the Hawaiian word for help and promoting K six K, the Kik Kamuamua." Yeah, celebration. King Kamehameha. Kamehameha, <laughs> yeah, sorry. <laughs> celebration. After hearing about the cancellation of the King Kamehameha Celebration Parade event statewide, Michael Miller, KH6ML, a community emergency coordinator, spoke with amateur radio operators and a few people with the commission to see if there was a level of interest to make the event happen. The event is authorized by the King Kamehameha Celebration Commission as an official event. It will give volunteer Hawaii operators a chance to test their communication equipment and skills and be ready to assist when the cell phone and internet fail. Successful radio contacts are eligible to receive a special and an inscribed certificate. The King Kamehameha Day holiday was proclaimed by King Kamehameha I's grandson, Lot Kapuaia, King Kamehameha V in 1871 followed by an inaugural celebration of events on June 11, 1872. Years later, in 1939, the commission was formed under Hawaii Territorial Legislature. Legislature. Okay. One thing I see that is left out of this uh, little thing is when this event is actually happening. And if you're listening to this, get on the radio right now, because <laughs> it's happening on Friday, June 19th, starting at about, I think it's like 10 a.m. Pacific. So, yeah, if you want to participate in this K6K event, you need to be on the radio at this very moment. <laughs> so, so get in touch with King Kamehameha. Oops. And tell him, Cart, you, what? <laughs> <laughs> oh, <it's> just, <laughs> we must have got the notice late, right? <laughs> no, the notice I got quite a while ago, but we also haven't recorded in two weeks. So... Oh, well, yeah, if it's not true. for nine more days, no, it's it's tomorrow or well today so as it, people are listening to this. So. Okay, you said June nineteenth. Did I? Yes. So it's oh. June tenth. It's, it's June eleventh. 
June 11th. Okay, no, you said the 19th, so... Oh, well, I screwed that up, but it's June 11th. I, I got it right. It's just like I said, if you're if you're listening to this, just be on the radio, because it's happening now. <laughs> it's so. happening right now, right? <laughs> <laughs> so... All right, so sorry that was late, but we didn't record for two weeks, and that's kind of hard to get things out when we didn't record for two weeks, but it, things happen. Sorry about that, but hopefully this will be, uh, it'll get out to a few people at least who need to contact Hawaii. So, all right, very good. Well, that takes us down to the end of the show, so we'll go ahead and wrap this one up. I want to thank uh, Michelle, W5NYV again of the Open Research Institute for being here and uh, telling us all about the stuff that's going on, and uh We'll go ahead and close this one out. But before we do, we want to tell who was in the chat room because we had quite a good crowd tonight. I guess that's what happens when you go away for a couple of weeks. People well, start all, caring again. They all came to listen <laughs> to Michelle. Well, yeah, that's true. So. Uh, we had Tony, K4XSS, Steve, K7HVT, Darren, VK6EK, Don, KC9ZMY, Don, KB2YSI, The Menace, Ted, WA0ER, and I, I did that again. It's The Menace, comma, Ted, WA0ER, and Bike Me, which, uh, yeah. <laughs> anyway, that's the end of the show. Thanks, everybody, listening for listening. This has been our deep dive into the Open Research Institute, episode number 415 of Linux in the Ham Shack. I'm Russ, K5TUX. I'm Cheryl, W5MOO. And I'm Bill, NE4RD, 73.